everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we're having a look at a not-so-secret weapon from World War II. This is Chaff, also known as Window to the British and Dupel to the Germans, and this was used to confuse and blind enemy radar. Now, I say not-so-secret weapon because we tend to associate the use of radar during World War II only with the Allies as if it was some sort of exclusive secret weapon that allowed us to defeat the Germans. And the way the story typically goes is that radar was invented in 1935 by British radio experts Robert Watson Watt and Arnold Wilkins, and that the first demonstration of radar took place on February 26th of that year near Daventry, where Watson Watt and Wilkins used a sort of cobbled together radio receiver in a van to detect a passing RAF Hayford bomber. And the myth further states that the Germans didn't have radar at the beginning of the war, and when they saw how effective the chain home radars were in the Battle of Britain, they then started developing their own. But this simply isn't true. German radar development actually goes back just as far as the British developments, and actually quite a bit farther back. As early as 1904, a German inventor named Christian Hussmeier demonstrated the ability to detect a ship at a distance of 5 kilometers using radio waves. And just think about that for a second. That's an extraordinary achievement because radio itself was brand new. Marconi had only made his first transatlantic transmission in 1901. And so this was really an idea that was way ahead of its time. Nobody knew what to do with it, and it never caught on, and Hussmeier had to go on to other things. And in 1935, just a couple of months after Watson, Watt, and Wilkins' demonstration, the Germans, under the direction of Dr. Hans Hollmann, who was their equivalent radar expert, demonstrated a radar that was able to detect the cruiser Königsberg at a distance of 8 kilometers in Kiel Harbor. And the result was that at the beginning of the war, the Germans actually had far more sophisticated radars than anything that the Allies had. And one of their main radars that they developed uh, before the war was called Freya, named after the Queen of the Gods, the wife of Odin in Norse and Germanic mythology. And if I might take a little bit of a sidebar here, the German habit of giving their weapons codenames based on mythology actually turned out to be something of an Achilles heel, security-wise. And one of the best examples of this took place during a period known as the Battle of the Beams, which is where the Germans were using various kinds of radio navigation aids to guide their bombers, their targets, over the UK. Devices like Knickerbein and Weigerate and Exgerate, and the British were trying to come up with various countermeasures. And during this period, uh, through Enigma decrypts, the British came across a new device called Votan, or Odin. And one of the analysts looked at this and he said, hmm, wait a second. In mythology, Odin only has one eye. So I wonder, is this a single beam navigational device as opposed to the double beam devices that the Germans have been using up to this point? And so they sent up an aircraft with radio receiver equipment, and sure enough, they found one of these single beams crossing the countryside and traced it to its transmitter on the coast of France. And this would happen a number of times during the war. The Germans thought they were being frightfully clever with all of these names, but unfortunately, a code name is meant to obscure the function of whatever it's applied to, so that didn't work out very well for them. Now, based on these experiences, after the war, the British adopted something called the Rainbow Codes. And this is a system whereby any new weapon or military device would be assigned a random color and a random noun. And you got really weird combinations there like Blue Peacock, uh, Orange Herald, Green Bamboo, and so on. But these code names perform their intended task. They obscured the nature of the device that they were applied to. Anyway, back to radar. So Freya was the Germans' long-range early warning radar that would initially pick up a flight of bombers headed towards them. And it worked in tandem with another type of radar called Würzburg, named after the German city. And this is a smaller radar with a parabolic dish, and there were a number of different versions of this. Uh, the first version, introduced in 1940, was road transportable. It actually folded up into a convenient trailer, 
There was a second version called Würzburg D introduced in 1941 that introduced conical scanning. So this is a technique for improving the tracking ability and the sensitivity of a radar. And later when they found that the initial Würzburg versions weren't quite accurate enough, they created Würzburg Reise uh, or giant Würzburg, which was a much larger dish uh, that was much more precise. But unfortunately, it was not road transportable. You had to use a train to move it around. And Freie and Würzburg worked in tandem as part of an interconnected air defense system. So Freie would first pick up the bomber stream, and then once it was in range, it would pass it off to Würzburg, which was then able to guide searchlights and anti-aircraft guns and night fighters onto the bombers themselves. There was also a naval version of Freie called Zetak, which operated a slightly different wavelength and was mounted on a number of cruisers and battleships. And interestingly enough, how the Allies got their first look at Zetak was following the 1939 Battle of the River Plate, in which the Admiral Graf Spee, the pocket battleship, was scuttled outside Montevideo Harbor. Unfortunately, the captain didn't realize that the ocean was very shallow at that point, and the Graf Spee only sank uh, up to its deck. So the superstructure, including the Zetak radar, were protruding above the waterline, and the Allies were able to just take a boat over and inspect it. And finally, although we associate airborne radar for night fighters exclusively with the Allies, the Germans also had airborne radar. It was called Liechtenstein, and it was mounted on a variety of night fighters, including the Messerschmitt DF-110 and the Junkers 88. So they had quite a variety of very sophisticated radars. However, German radar really doesn't get the respect it deserves. And I think this has to do with two main factors other than, of course, pure nationalism. And these are operating wavelength and numbers. German radar, like a lot of early radar, operated at fairly long wavelengths. Uh, for example, Freya operated at 1.2 meters. And in radar, you typically want a shorter wavelength for greater precision and accuracy, especially when you're trying to guide something like anti-aircraft guns onto target. And this was due to German radar technology being based on a linear oscillator tube known as a Kleistron. And this was fairly limited in the wavelengths it could produce. You could produce short wavelengths with it, but you needed an extraordinary amount of power to do so. But still, 1.2 meters wasn't bad when you compare it to the British chain home radars, which operated at a wavelength of 22 meters, which can tell you that a large flight of bombers is heading towards you, but not much else. Uh, but Chain Home had two main advantages. Number one, it was integrated into a very effective command and control system that was efficiently able to scramble fighters to intercept incoming bombers. It was also far simpler and cheaper to build than German radars, and so the British were able to effectively cover the entire south coast of England in radars, whereas the Germans, with their far more complicated and expensive radar, only had eight Freie units operational by the beginning of the war. And shortly after the Battle of Britain, the Allies would leapfrog the Germans in terms of radar capability thanks to one of the key technical innovations of the Second World War, which was the cavity magnetron, which was developed by John Randall and Harry Boot at the University of Birmingham in 1940. And the cavity magnetron was a special type of vacuum tube that allowed for the efficient production of centimetric radar waves in the microwave spectrum. And this allowed for the production of radars that were not only significantly more accurate and precise than the German models, but also lighter and more compact so they could be easily carried by aircraft. And so, for example, you could put these in night fighters. So they could hunt down German bombers at night. Uh, you could put them in maritime patrol aircraft. And by the end of the war, uh, the technology had gotten so good that the wavelength had shrunk down to around three centimeters. And this allowed a maritime patrol aircraft to detect something as small as the periscope of a submerged German U-boat. And this left the U-boats with effectively nowhere to hide, and it really turned the tide in the Battle of the Atlantic. And centimetric radar was also used in the form of H2S, which was a ground scanning radar carried by bombers that allowed you to navigate and find your target more easily at night. Though the British were actually quite hesitant to use this at first because they feared that if a bomber was shot down and the components of H2S were discovered, the Germans would be able to reverse engineer the magnetron and produce their own centimetric radar, 
So the first H2S sets actually came with a self-destruct mechanism, a little explosive charge that the bombardier or the navigator was supposed to activate if you're going down in flames to destroy the unit. But it was found that this was futile because the main working part of the magnetron, this big copper block with holes drilled in it, was impervious to pretty much any explosive. So uh, those self-destruct mechanisms were very quickly eliminated. And the British realized that the advantage of using H2S on bombing raids exceeded any risk of the Germans discovering it, and discovered the Germans did. And they did eventually produce their own magnetron-based airborne radar for night fighters called the Fug 240 Berlin. But unfortunately, this only entered service in April 1945, so just a month before the war ended, and so it had almost no impact on the end of the conflict. Now, none of this is to suggest that German radar was in any way ineffective. Far from it. The Allies actually expended quite a bit of effort trying to learn as much as they could about German radar and develop effective countermeasures. And this included launching a rather daring commando raid on the night of the 27th of February 1942 called Operation Biting. And this was led by Airborne Major John Frost, who later became famous for leading the Paras into Arnhem during Operation Market Garden. And it involved a small group of paratroopers and a radar expert being parachuted onto a Würzburg site on the coast of France near Bruneval. And then they infiltrated the site, uh, dismantled some of the radar and took some key components, and then were evacuated by sea. And because of this raid, the British were able to learn quite a bit about Würzburg, and this informed later efforts at jamming it. And most of these early efforts were active jamming devices, and these came in a whole wide variety with really weird names like Airborne Cigar, and Mandrel, and Moonshine, and Pipe Rack, and I'll, I'll put up a list of all of the devices that they had. And these worked either by transmitting white noise on the same frequency as the radar to produce this garbled return that was very hard to interpret, or by receiving the signal, boosting the return to make it look like there was a much larger fleet of aircraft than there actually was. And uh, two of these, Mandrel and Moonshine, were so effective that a flight of eight aircraft uh, equipped with this equipment could actually simulate a bomber force of 100 aircraft. But the British would soon come up with a solution that was far simpler than this, which we now know as chaff. And this was suggested way back in 1937 by Gerald Touch, who was an associate of Robert Watson Watt. And he suggested using thin strips of aluminum foil thrown out of an aircraft to create this big cloud of strong radar returns that would overwhelm and confuse enemy radar operators. And this idea sort of floated around for a bit until 1942 when it was refined into its final form, known as Window, by Joan Curran of the Telecommunications Research Establishment, or TRE. And the original idea had actually been to produce these letter-sized pieces of aluminum-backed paper with a propaganda leaflet on the other sides so that could serve double duty. But Joan Curran determined that the ideal dimensions for these strips of radar reflective foil were 27 centimeters long and 1 to 2 centimeters wide. And the rule with chaff is that you cut it to half the wavelength of the radar you're trying to jam, in this case, Würzburg. And these strips would then be put into bundles of around one pound in weight each and would be distributed by throwing them out the flare chute of a bomber. Later, they would come up with automatic dispensers that could actually drop them at regular intervals to make it look as though a large group of bombers was steadily advancing across the countryside. And you could use this in any number of ways. Uh, you could either just blind the radar by putting out big clouds of chaff all over the place, or you could send one or two diversionary bombers on a completely different route, dropping chaff to make the radar operators think that the bomber stream was headed in a completely different direction. Now, despite the fact that this was a potentially very cheap and very effective countermeasure against German radar, the British were actually very hesitant at first to use window in combat. And this is because they feared that once the Germans found these pieces of aluminum foil drifting down uh, around, around the countryside, they would very quickly figure out what they were for, copy it, and use it to stage raids against the British Isles. And so top government officials, including Professor Lindemann, who was Winston Churchill's scientific advisor, 
sort of blocked the use of window uh, for quite some time until the summer of 1943, in fact. And at that point, it was finally decided that, well, all the German bombers are on the Russian front. They really don't have the resources available right now to make a serious raid on the British Isles. We might as well use this. And use it they did for the first time during Operation Gomorrah, which was the infamous firebombing of Hamburg, which took place over a week between July 24th and July 30th, 1943. And this is one of the first thousand bomber raids to use a whole bunch of techniques that were pioneered earlier in the war, such as the bomber stream, pathfinders, which are aircraft that flew ahead to mark the target with flares, H2S ground scanning radar, and window. And window was particularly effective. The German radar operators were completely blinded. The radar guided searchlights just aimlessly scanned the sky and the anti-aircraft guns and night fighters were not able to find the bombers. And this allowed the RAF and the U.S. Army Air Force bombing during the day to utterly devastate Hamburg. The incendiary bombs created what's known as a firestorm, which is basically a tornado made of flame that sucks air into it so quickly that there were 100 kilometer an hour winds that swept people off their feet in the street into the inferno. And a lot of the people who died died in the air raid shelters because the fire just sucked the oxygen out of them. And most of Hamburg was just obliterated and 40,000 people died, approximately. And all this for the loss of only 12 British bombers in the first two nights of the raid and 57 bombers overall during the entire raid, which was an absurdly low attrition rate, all things considered. And so Window was declared a great success and it was used extensively throughout the rest of the war. So let's actually have a look at some real examples of World War II chaff, or window. Up top here we have more traditional style window, although this is fairly late war because the earlier versions, like I said, are around one to two centimeters wide. This is considerably thinner. And it's cut to around 30 centimeters in length, which is half the wavelength of the Würzburg radar that this was designed to jam. And the Allies typically just tried to jam Würzburg because trying to jam the longer range uh, Freya early warning radar would have meant dropping window from the very beginning of their mission, which was just not practical. However, there was one occasion in which the Allies did try to fool Freya and Zetakt radars, and that was in the lead up to Operation Overlord, D-Day. So on the morning of June 6, 1944, uh, the British launched the twin operations, Operation Glimmer and Operation Taxable. And the idea behind these was to convince German coastal radar operators that a large invasion fleet was headed towards the Pas de Calais area rather than Normandy. And this had two parts to it. There were small motorboats that were trailing balloons with radar reflectors on them to represent the actual invasion fleet. And then there were bombers that were dropping chaff above them to represent the air support that was accompanying the fleet. And because they were jamming Freya, they needed a much longer style of window in order to match the long wavelength of that particular radar. And that's what this is. Uh, this is a form of window that was codenamed Rope. And as you can see, it's significantly longer than this one. And it has a long strip of aluminum foil with a little strip of silk, and then it has its own little parachute to stop this big heavy strip of aluminum from falling too quickly. So that was the main use of the Freya jamming window. Now, as I said, the British were afraid for quite some time that the Germans would quickly figure out what window was for and copy it and use it against them. What they didn't realize was that this was such an obvious idea to anybody who's even passingly familiar with radar that the Germans had already come up with it independently and they called their version Duppel after the suburb of Berlin where it was developed. And ironically, the Germans were also afraid that if they used it over the British Isles, the British would copy it and use it against them. And so unbeknownst to each other, there was this sort of mutually assured destruction standoff for, uh, for around a year where neither dared use chaff against the other, which is very similar to the situation with poison gas during the war. And then finally, the British decided to use theirs on Operation Gomorrah, and a couple of months after that, the Germans used their own version, Duppel, over the British Isles. And they also made extensive use of it 
during Operation Steinbock or the Baby Blitz at the beginning of 1944. But unfortunately, by this time, the Luftwaffe was not what it once was. Uh, British air defenses were too powerful. The Germans didn't have enough fuel and spare parts and aircraft. And these raids were generally ineffective and really petered out towards the end of the war. So because this was such an obvious idea, it probably won't surprise you to know that the Americans also came up with it independently at the exact same time. And there it was first proposed by Fred Whipple, who's a very famous astronomer, and perfected by a gentleman named Merwin Bly, who was working for the US Navy. And a problem Bly ran into very early on was that his uh, strips of chaff tended to clump together because of electrostatic attraction and didn't disperse very nicely. So what he came up with was a special cartridge which used a small gunpowder charge to push the strips of chaff out. And as they rubbed up against the side of the cartridge, they would all be imparted with an identical electrostatic charge, like charges repel, and so it would cause them to disperse very nicely and create the best possible cloud for radio returns. The Japanese also came up with chaff at the exact same time. They called theirs giman shi, which means deceiving paper. And this is used to a limited extent, especially during the campaign in the Solomons and the U.S. invasion of Iwo Jima, especially to cover kamikaze attacks. Now, while Window was extremely effective against German air defenses, it didn't quite stop them in their tracks. The Germans were able to find ways around it. And one of these was the so-called Wilde Sau tactic, where because the Liechtenstein radars on the German night fighters were also blocked by window, uh, the Germans started using day fighters without any radar at night, using techniques like trying to silhouette the bombers against the cloud base or against the burning city below. And for a while, this was effective, but it made for some very dangerous flying, especially when you don't have radar to guide your way. Uh, they also took advantage of one of the chief disadvantages of chaff, which is that a cloud of chaff compared to the aircraft that dropped it is stationary. So if you can look at the Doppler shift of a radar contact and not just its main reflection, you can filter out the stationary chaff and focus only on uh, objects that are moving at a certain speed. And so the Germans came up with a system called Laus, which they retrofitted onto most of their radar sets which did just this. It looked at the Doppler shift and filtered out anything that was moving below a certain speed. Unfortunately, this was applied fairly late in the war and it really didn't have all that much effect on the Allied bombing campaign. So of course, chaff continued to be used well after the war and is still carried by military aircraft to this day and I actually have a sample of post-war chaff right here. Now, unfortunately, I can't tell you very much about this particular chaff. I found it in the ejection seat of a Lockheed T-33 that I was helping to restore, but wasn't able to find any information about the particular model. I'm assuming that it's NATO chaff from around the 50s or 60s, and this is supported by the fact that it's cut to 4 centimeters in length, meaning that it's designed to jam a radar with a wavelength of 8 centimeters, and this lies at the extreme end of the S-band, which was commonly used by Soviet radars in the 50s and 60s. So that's probably what it is. Now, the paper wrapper that it comes in is only about half full. It would have been filled so that it was a solid cylindrical plug. And a number of these bundles would have been loaded into a cartridge, which would fire all of them out at once when the pilot activated his countermeasures. Now, a number of improvements have been made to chaff over the years. One of the earliest ones was to add a strip of lead off center to cause the strips to tumble end over end and create a stronger radar return. Some of them also received a specialized coating to prevent them from clumping together and improve dispersion. And now they're no longer actually made of paper anymore. Uh, they're usually strips of fiberglass that have been aluminized. Of course, none of these improvements address the fundamental flaw with chaff, which I've discussed before, which is that it's effectively stationary and can easily be filtered out if you take Doppler shift into account. So what a lot of aircraft do today is employ a system called uh, jammer plus chaff or chaff illuminated, where they'll drop chaff and then a special radar transmitter will reflect a jamming signal off of the chaff itself, and this can be adjusted to actually simulate the Doppler shift uh, 
of an actual moving aircraft and create a radar contact that's far more realistic than just chaff on its own. Now before I end the video, there's just one final fun story that I want to tell you. Even though chaff had become a standard piece of military kit by the 1980s, one aircraft that it strangely wasn't fitted to was the Hawker Sea Harrier. And this became something of a problem during the 1982 Falklands War because the Argentine forces had fairly sophisticated radar-guided anti-aircraft missiles. And so to correct this, the crews aboard the British aircraft carriers uh, fitted the Harriers with an improvised, a MacGyvered chaff dispenser that was actually installed in the speed brakes. So this was made out of welding rod and string and pins and all sorts of different things so that when the pilot opened up his speed brakes, it would dispense the chaff. And they called this the Heath Robinson chaff dispenser. And Heath Robinson was a British cartoonist who was the equivalent of Rube Goldberg. So when you hear somebody from the UK call something Heath Robinson, it means, you know, overly complicated. Uh, so just like a Rube Goldberg machine. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. A huge thank you to my friend Matt Heinz, who provided the samples of window for me to look at today. There's plenty more in his collection that I'll be looking at in future videos, so stay tuned for that. And if you didn't see my last video, I'm less than 100 subscribers away now from the thousand I need to monetize the channel. And to celebrate the monetization of the channel and my eventual opening of a Patreon account, I'm going to be releasing a now four-part review of the film The Right Stuff. So if you want to see that sooner rather than later, please talk to your friends and families and subscribe to the channel. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, tune in next time for another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where we'll look at yet another fascinating artifact just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.